meet you and get to know you a little bit better. But for the rest of you, you've seen me around a lot. I've been in the chamber a little over a year now, I think. I think it's been a little over. I don't know. It seems like it's my family now. So um, I welcome you all. I want to just kind of give you a little bit of what we're going to be going over today. Branding is a very big topic. Uh, kind of like coming and learning, trying to learn marketing in an hour and a half, right, Paul? <laughs> you really have to just boil it down and look at some of the key concepts. So that's what I'm going to be doing today. I'm kind of calling this like a branding 101. Um, give you some key concepts that you can take. And I'm hoping when you walk out of here today, you not only walked out with some new ideas that you can immediately apply to your business, but some other things um, that you want to go home and work on so that you can make your branding even better. Okay? All right, so I want to go over a quick review. There's a lot of you that were here last time, but some of you didn't make it. And Paul went over the elements of marketing. So first he talked about the four P's. You got your product, your price, your positioning or placement of the product, which is how it's sold, and promotion. And he touched on all of those, but what Paul really did, because he's so artistic at this, is went over the art of listening and storytelling. There were a variety of very fun exercises that had us on the floor, laughing. Unfortunately, I'm not quite the comedian Paul is, so you won't be having to do that today. Um, but I am going to tie in and really tell you how those elements of marketing and how listening and storytelling is so important to branding your business. That's really, especially the, the listening part, is going to be really important to understanding what you need to do when you're creating your brand. Okay? So what you're going to learn, and then talk about what branding is. A lot of you probably have a little bit of a narrower concept of branding and what it really encompasses. There's a lot to branding. I'm um, going to talk about four steps in creating your brand. Now I, I boiled it down to four simple steps. There are many things that someone might take you through if you're going to go through and talk with a professional marketer about creating your brand. We're going to go over some brand marketing strategies, and primarily we're going to talk about online brand management and offline brand management. So I'm going to be showing you a little video that I think really breaks this down, and after this two minutes, we'll be done. We can just talk the rest of the time and have fun. Just kidding. But it, it talks about the history of branding, and it's also going to give you a little bit of an idea of how big branding is. Before I do that, though, I just want to ask a couple of you if you can tell me your definition of branding. And if nobody raises their hand, I'm picking on the back row. Uh, <laughs> Tina, Rebecca, you are select tax and bookkeeping branding. <laughs> exactly. She helps us. So we're working we're working on their branding, which is getting us see. But what what do you guys consider the purposes of branding when you think about that? What did you come to learn today? What did you come to learn today, Missy? Well, when I thought of branding, I, I thought of logos are, are kind of important. Right. So we have a penguin, mm -hmm. and when Hans drives his truck around town, I want people to see that truck. Absolutely. Anyone else? What else do you think of a brand? <coughs> if, uh, company mm -hmm. reputation. Absolutely. How much you need? Lynette. Lynette. Okay. Uh, reputation. Anyone else have something else to think about? Paul? Um, I think a feeling, like when you think of Apple or Walmart, and kind of what makes you feel. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's the part so many people miss. Mm -hmm. The most common response when people think of branding is their logo, those visual aspects that people see. But branding really is, it, it, it exists physically, but really where it exists, the value is in the mind of your customer. So it's really that emotional connection that you're making with your clients and your potential clients. We'll sit back and uh, watch this real quick for a minute.
brand even you, right? So branding, as you saw from that, it's all over the history, but what I hope you really caught from that is that branding is not my big business and can generate a lot of trust and loyalty, but really brands are about so much more than just that logo. It's about that connection. I just wanted to re reinforce that. And thanks to you too, there's a wealth of information like that online. Um, this is a quote from Seth Godin. Any of you familiar with him? He's a, a marketing sales author. And I really like the way he broke it down. So he says a brand is your set of expectations, memories, stories, and relationships that when you take together, account for a consumer's decision to choose one product over another or you over some of your competition, right? So if the consumer, no matter who they are, doesn't pay a premium, spend the money, make a selection or spread the word, then you have no brand value. Okay, so if you're, if you're struggling to get clients to choose you and you're feeling lost in that sea of competition, then branding is something that you really, really need to focus on. And what's in a brand? Well, your brand is going to define who you are and what you do and set you apart from others. We've had, uh, many of you are familiar with Jason Dries, and he talks a lot about what do you do. But then he says, well, what do you really do? So your brand isn't just, I'm a plumber, I'm a photographer. Your brand is the benefit to the consumer that they're going to emotionally attach to, and that's going to make them choose you over someone else, right? And you have to make sure that you realize it's communicated, again, through everything you do. Your brand is communicated through the physical aspects, like your logo, but it's also communicated through your customer service, through how your building looks, or how you or your employees show up at a customer's house if you provide a service. So keep in mind that when you're branding, it flows into every aspect. And one thing I see small businesses fail to do is take the time to make sure everyone in the organization understands their brand and what they're trying to convey by it. I know when I was in corporate, the first one to three days on the job you spent in training, learning what are the company's values, what's their mission, how do they want you, expect you to talk to customers, how do you, you know, really <coughs> get people outside. That doesn't happen in small businesses oftentimes. These people just get thrown on the job, they're trained on the job, but there's no formal training. And I caution you that it's wise to take that time, even if it's only an hour, to really sit down and say, this is what we're about. Please make sure that that's what you're conveying to our buying public. Okay? What you're trying to do, I like this, this is from a, a company called Flying Hippo. They say, you want to be that spotted zebra in a land of stripes. You've got to stand out if you really want to do well in this day and age. And you, you're competing with not only a lot of companies, but a lot of media, a lot of messages out there. So I touched on this briefly, but branding, why it's so important. Um, Tina, in our last meeting that we had at Thrive, she really talked about trust and the importance of trust. And a logo doesn't so much convey trust. That's conveyed through your customer service, through the service you're providing. It's that whole idea of that let's under-promise and over-deliver. Right? That's what's going to convey your trust. But it's also going to provide loyalty and allow you to um, charge a premium price. So one reason that branding can be important, like the penguin, is let's say people, um, people need plumbing services. How often, Nancy? I'm sure you get repeat customers, but they're not calling you all the time, right? Right. I mean, as far as um, the plumbing, sometimes it can carry us through, but um, the one that um, most people use in that emergency is to get it done ASAP. Right. We're, what you're really looking for when you create like your logo and your message to the world is something that's going to have an impact and stick in people's minds. We tend to think visually, so things we hear may not stick with us. If you have a logo or a tagline or something that sticks in people's minds, let's say they call Hans for plumbing and they don't need plumbing services again for five years. They may not remember the name Class Act Plumbing, but if they go online and start looking for a plumber and then they see their little logo and they went, oh yeah, it was that guy that I used. I I've experienced that myself. I've had people I've done business with that I really thought they did a great job, but I couldn't remember who, what their name was years later. And maybe they had nothing that really stood out in their branding. I heard about them referral, especially years ago before the internet was so prevalent. Never called them again because I never heard from them again. They didn't have anything that stood out in my mind that would help me reconnect to them. So those are all things that you want to be thinking about. How can you make that impression? Um, we'll, we'll talk about a few, we're only going to talk about a few of those ways visually, but um, always keep those things in mind. So I'm going to move on to creating your brand. And again, I said, boil this down to 
that's four steps. There can be many, but here's some four simple steps so that when you guys go home, you don't feel like you're overwhelmed with a checklist of 100 things to do, right? The first is market research, and then we'll go on to defining your brand, designing your logo, and I'm only going to primarily focus on the logo, but I'm also going to touch on your tagline and a couple other things that you can think about. And then your identity system, which is how you take your brand and show it to the world. The market research, I consider market research to be the number one most important part of your branding exercise. Because if you don't know who you're marketing to, then your marketing is more than likely going to fail. Okay, so you have to go out and get to know your customers. You want to make sure you know how they think and feel about you and your services. So be asking for feedback from your current clients. It's one of the most valuable things that you can do is to talk to people who have actually used the products and services and ask them to be candid. What did they like? What did they not like? What could you have done better? Because that's how you're really going to improve. Your psychographics is how they think. Um, why do they spend money the way that they do? How do they feel when they're relating to a brand? Well, are they the type of person that's going to go to Safeway and buy a generic versus Heinz, right? And if people have different relationships with products and services and different reasons why they might choose to buy brand versus generic or go with one person over another. So those buying habits can be really important, especially if you're trying to market yourself as a more premium brand. Okay? And finally, do research your competition. How do people feel about other brands and why are they attracted to certain brands? You can see a huge difference, for example, between people that are Apple fans and people who maybe choose an Android. Right? I, I'm, I'm one of those Android people and have my reasons, but <laughs> it's funny to hear the passion that people have for Apple products. They've, they've built such a loyal fan base, and there's a lot of psychology that goes into that. Apple knows their market really, really well, and they know how to push their hot buttons. Okay, so how can you find out what people are looking for? What do they want? Well, their easy way is indirect research. We have so much information at our fingertips now online. You can go out to social media, go out to forums, do a little research, go in and type in keywords related to your business. Um, you know, if you're au pair, right, go in and type that in, see what people are saying about that, or child care. What kind of things are bothering them? What kind of questions are they asking? What kind of recommendations are they looking for? And start to make a list of those things that seem important to your potential clients. You can also go out and use keyword tools like Google AdWords. Um, keyword tools like Google AdWords are going to help you figure out the types of questions people are asking a lot. And at the same token, I caution you, if you go out and choose a keyword that has a lot of searches, do you think you're going to stand out? No. You actually want to look for those things where people are searching regularly, but there's a niche. There's not so many people that you're going to be lost in that same competition. And then direct research, my absolute favorite is going to be interviews. Again, ask your current customers and, or potential customers what they're looking for, how you can stand out, because you're going to get the most value from having that one-on-one -on -one interaction. Marketing and branding and research is not a science. There's a lot of art to it. You have to go and find out what people really want, and that's, what again, since it's an emotion you're after, you can't always get that just from trying to do it analytically. You have to have some emotion and some gut feeling involved in that. If you don't have current customers, you're looking to branch into a new business or product or service, then go ahead and take advantage of focus groups or questionnaires and try to get just a general sense from the public. It's better than having nothing. Okay. So we're going to take a little break. I have a series of activities, and that's what you have in front of you in this, this little booklet that you got. And the reason why I did this is so that you don't walk away overwhelmed and feel like you've got to start from scratch. So we're going to do a few activities. And this one is going to be to start to figure out who your ideal proof of customer is. And this is not just any customer. This is that dream customer that says, I love you, and they're going to tell everybody about you, whether they need your products or services or not, okay? This is your loyal rating fan. And the purpose of this is so that you start to create that picture. So as you're creating your brand, and as you're doing any marketing, you're always looking at that person and thinking of targeting that person. I encourage you to actually develop this to the point where you have no more than three, we call this a buyer persona, one to three of these images where you have even gone on the internet and found a picture that you think represents that person. You've given them a name, 
<laughs> when you go to market, you're going, this ad is to target Susie Q. I, you know, you, you know exactly who they are. And a lot of people give them funny names. And did any of you feel like you successfully got into your ideal customer's head a little bit? Do you want to tell me a little bit about what insights you got from doing that? Uh, I, well, I have a pretty clear idea of who I'm targeting, so it was very easy for me to fill this out. Good. So you've spent some time thinking about that for me. Definitely. Yeah. Very good. Now, did you fill out every single field, including the ones on the bottom? I did. All right. Very good. One yeah, thing. And I did the seven traits. You did that. She already did the take home exercise. Oh, Remember, yeah. she's, she's <laughs> definitely <laughs> thought about this. So, yes, I did because I knew many of you wouldn't have time to get even maybe through this, let alone kind of finish it off. But there is a little take home exercise to take this and take it even to another level. I, identifying top seven traits of your client. And then the challenge for you is when you've gone through this exercise, start thinking about someone out there that you have been wanting to have as a client or now that you can think of, hey, that would be a perfect client. And challenge you to reach out to them in the next week. Take this and make some use out of the exercise that you've gone through, okay? Now, one of the things I'm gonna caution you about because when I tested this out on my husband, on the bottom, he said not applicable on a bunch of those yes or no, circle one or the other. Can you put a picture on your wall of a man and a woman at the same time? No. Can they be married and unmarried? No. You have to think, like this, this earlier slide said, you can't have it all. Your buyer persona, that ideal dream customer, cannot be everything. It cannot be both a man and a woman. It can't be 18 and 35, right? So really niche down and pick that one person that you want to focus on initially. And then if you want to go, if you say, you know, my audience really is broad in this and I want to have more than one marketing message or more than one branding message, maybe because you have multiple products and services, then go through the exercise again. But don't try to make a particular message meet everyone. Your small businesses, how many of you here have this kind of an advertising budget like our friends at RC Willie? Do you think that in your whole year you can maybe even afford a spread like this in the Sunday paper? Probably not. They can afford to brand to everyone who wants furniture. We can't. Okay, so you have to think differently. I know it's sometimes very attractive to think, ah, oh, I want to do this because Apple does it. And, but, you know, even Apple does it. Apple's not marketing to me. They're not marketing to the person who grew up using IBM computers as a developer and is used to having all that technical capability. They're marketing to people who love the bells and whistles and the prettiness and the simplicity. And I'll be honest, I always thought computers were very self-explanatory until I got on a Mac. And I couldn't figure out how it worked. Because to me, it, it didn't work. It, it uses a completely different thought process. Okay? All right, so we're going to move on to defining your brand. And I'm only going to touch on this briefly. I know most of you already have a brand name. But in case, I know originally they were talking about calling this session branding your product and service. So I decided to touch on brand names real briefly um, in case you guys are deciding to start a new business, franchise a new product or service, anything like that, or you're thinking about rebranding. Now, there are many elements, and the idea here is to capture as many of these things in your name as possible. We've got making it clear, memorable, unique, having that emotional connection again and credible and timeless. One of the things that you may be inspired to do by those big names like Coca-Cola, Dell, all of them, is come up with something different, a Yahoo or a Yelp. Now you may get people that will tell you different things, but I will tell you my own opinion, and, and <coughs> I'm not real. But as a local business person, do you think it's wise to necessarily pick a name that means nothing to anyone when they first see it? No. I really think that it is much smarter as a small business owner who focuses on local clients to go out and pick a name that makes sense when they see it. Black Talk Comedy, do I have any doubt that they do something fun and funny here? No. Right? Um, you've got plumbing companies where they, you know, class act plumbing. No, they're, that's a plumber. Right? If you've got catering, you guys both, it's very clear what you guys do by your name. That's a smart technique because when people go and they're looking for you, if your name doesn't say what you do at all, and you don't have an RC Willie budget, they're probably going to pass right by you. Okay, so keep that in mind. This is the real part I want to focus on, though, is your it factor, and this is where we talk about how you stand out. Why are you unique? What makes you you? 
And this encompasses your story. So this goes into what Paul really went into last time, the art of telling your story. Who are you? Why are you different and unique? And, and how do you provide value to your clients? And why? Why are you even doing it? Because most small business people, they want to do business people they like and trust. They're going to like you when, they, when you like what you do. If they're dealing with you and you're just like, oh, I don't want to work again today. I went through that for many years because the last five years of my job, I didn't like what I did anymore. And I would not have been a good person to, to be working one-on-one -on -one with somebody providing services because right now, the people who I'm going to do business with, I know that not only are they good at what they do, but in general, they actually like what they do. So they're fun to be around. They're fun to have the services provided. And another important part to see that this relates back to exercise one is the way you see your company, the way you think you're putting your company out to the world may not be in alignment with how people are actually seeing it. <coughs> so it becomes so important, again, to know your customer and ask them, hey, this is what I am trying to make sure people see. Is that actually coming across to you? How do you feel when you hear my story? Because I think I'm funny. Or I think my story just would motivate you to say, yeah. You know, like for, for me, for instance, I say, you know, I, I'm sure a lot of you feel burdened by marketing. It's yet another thing you have to do. Uh, do you want to be the accountant, the um, person who changes your tires, the person who does your marketing? Do you want to do everything for your house and your business, or do you want to do what you do best? Right? That's, that's part of my story. I'm, I'm trying to touch into that. Quit trying to be everything. Because it's going to wear you out. But some of my clients may go, no, that's not what you're saying at all. <laughs> I need to know that. So an easy way to really start to focus in on this is to think of your brand and your it factor as, as a person, for example. Give it personal characteristics. Think of the difference between, for example, Celine Dion and Lady Gaga. Okay, they're very different. And when people hear about them or see them, they immediately are going to attract a certain audience, right? They have that certain it factor that draws people in. If you go through a full branding session with a lot of companies that focus on this, they'll not only have you look in terms of what person is your company or service most like, they'll have you go through a whole series. What car, what song, what movie, what animal? And then they start to take all of those things together that you can convey your business and pull them into what makes you special and unique. Right? Because you can have two strong animals, for example. You could have a, a rhino and an elephant, and they're both strong but they convey different things to people, okay? And this, this kind of relates to both. This is that talking about that it factor. This is one of our chamber members, Alexandria Goff. She recently sent out an ad in the e-news, and it caught my attention because she did a very specific ad. And so I thought what she did well is she's going after a certain target audience, and she's going after them with a very particular benefit. She, her whole ad was for equine trust. Horse trust. I don't own a horse, so honestly, I kind of went fully. The reason why it caught my eye was because I knew I was doing this. I said, wow, there is an example of how people need to think narrow and deep. Anybody who doesn't own a horse probably immediately believed that ad. But if you did and you care about your horses and you're wondering, oh my gosh, I even thought, what am I going to What's going to happen to my horses if I die? And I, I put a lot of money into these animals. And some people invest multi hundred thousands or millions of dollars in their horses. For those people, they're going to remember her name because they want to go for the specialist, the expert, not just somebody who does estate law and knows nothing about horses and no idea what they need to be thinking about, right? So she is not getting a lot of customers from that ad, but the people who notice that are very good potential clients, okay? And this is another local marketer, Barry Feldman. He talks about the importance of that. He says the mistake brands make, whether it's personal or for your business, is they want to be everything to everybody. And that's no way to succeed. Your business might be a good example. So if you develop a beachhead, and in his example, because he does marketing, he says, let's say, for example, you have Google Plus expertise. It doesn't mean that's all you do. But the more niche you are in modern media, the more likely you are to succeed. So what he's trying to convey there is, let's say for Ali Goff, she gets somebody who wants her to create a horse trust. If she does a good job, do you think that they're going to stop there? Or are they going to use her for the whole estate? If you're really good at that niche, that specific thing you do, they're going to want to know what else you do. Okay? So keep that in mind. It doesn't mean that you have to be narrow. It just means that you start with the focus so that you can market wisely and spend your dollars wisely. 
All right. So moving to step three in those four steps, we're going to talk a little bit about designing your brand. We have your logo, your tagline, and then how your brand is expressed. And I talk about your story, your style, and your behavior. Your um, story is how you say things about yourself. This is kind of like your tagline or your 10-second commercial or 60-second commercial. This is, this is how you're telling people you are. Your brand style is how you look. What? When you walk out of the house and you're representing your brand, how are you dressed? What does your business look like? Um, I mean, a fun example, any of you that walked in the bathroom, long stay, short stay, they've got two little books there, one's a Cliff Notes version. I mean, it's funny, right? It's consistent with the brand. You, you want to be looking, thinking of those little touches that stick in people's minds, and that's something I, I, oh wow, that's cool, right? And then your behavior is, are you congruent? There's what you say, and there's what you show, are those things in alignment with what you do? Okay? Logos, it's pretty simple. You have three choices. You can do a text logo, like Google. You can do an image logo, which typically will include some type of text, but not always. Depends on how you named your business. And an abstract symbol, like Nike. Which of these three would I not recommend for you guys? Nike. Exactly. <laughs> because, again, how expensive is it to brand an image only? Very, right? Most of you, I would actually say, if you have a limited budget, start with a text only logo. It can work very well. It may not be as flashy and as catchy, but they're in, much less expensive to create. And remember, you can always rebrand and add an image to your logo down the road. Okay? <coughs> the important thing to keep in mind is making it clean and functional. I have seen a number of people who have a logo, had it designed by somebody who was their friend or relative and really didn't understand what was needed, and they have it like in a JPEG. Guess what happens when they want to go to a trade show and put it on a banner? It's fuzzy. You have to have a designer that knows the right formats to create your logo in, typically a vector that can be scaled small or large. You want to make sure that it's not busy. If you have a logo that has too many colors or just too much detail, guess what? It's going to look horrible small. It's going to be confusing to people and it won't be memorable. Okay? So for most of you, keep it to two colors, maybe three at the tops. And keep in mind that um, a single image is usually best. You don't want to have, don't try to convey everything again. It's that what one thing do you do best? If you do multiple things, pick that one thing and represent that in your image. And um, make sure it's really easy to reproduce, both in color and in black and white. Because there are going to be times that you want to put your logo on something and it's not going to be in color. So make sure it looks good that way and make sure it's delivered to you that way. I would actually recommend that your designer give you a black and white version so it's nice and clean. Okay? Now we're going to talk about taglines for a second. Uh, these are optional. Personally, I don't have one, but they are a great way to catch attention. And um, I know many of you have heard some good ones. So who can tell me a memorable one from a local business? Anyone? Rebecca, can you? What exactly is it? Tagline would be like Rockland Electric, it's a small yeah. world, but lit. That's what I thought. Okay. Ours is like it never even happened because we're a restoration. Absolutely. There is a real estate agent in Grass Valley that said it's easy as pie. She was a shop agent there. <clears throat> okay. She served pie to open houses. There we go. So she oh, folded it to her brand. Okay. Um, another one, we've got Kathy Moore. She says, for choosing the right insurance, is no accident. Right? Um, I can't remember Tucker Travel or Jack, but she does concierge travel and she just said something like, pack your bags, leave the rest to me. You know, it's those types of, so if you can have something that's catchy, memorable, and not confusing, it, it can be a great benefit to your service, but don't, don't force it, right? It, it truly is optional, but it can be a good thing to do. I don't always recommend, though, a lot of people think they need to have a tagline, they need to attach it to their logo. Make your logo busy. Right? You, you need to make sure your logo stands alone and doesn't need a tagline. We're going to move on to your identity system. Again, I didn't touch on there. Part of your branding might be music. It might be all kinds of different physical aspects that you may want to have. Exactly how you do packaging, things like that. But we're going to keep it simple. Today's 101, right? Your identity system is where you're going to use these visual elements. And you want to decide that again because you should decide this before you have your logo created because you want to make sure that it's going to work wherever you're going to place it. 
For example, my logo, really, um, it's not going to work like on a, on a shirt. You know, if I, if I try to put my, my logo on certain things because of the different colors and the sizing of it, it, it may not work unless I had an embroidery, right? Um, it's not going to work on just a two color because I've got three colors in my logo. You, you want to look at, are you going to put it on, on pamphlets, flyers, different things like that? How's it going to fit in? Are you needing a logo that's longer than it is wide or wider than it is long because of certain things that you want to do? Like if you want to put your logo on pens, it probably needs to be a longer logo instead of a tall logo. Okay, so we'll be thinking about those things. And it's going to apply everywhere, your products and packaging, your signs, your email newsletters, your clothing, and your stationery. Um, one thing to touch on here again, because I like to give some things I've seen a lot, your email address is part of your branding. I know many small business people end up going out and getting a free email address, Gmail, Yahoo, so on. When you're trying to build trust, and make people believe that you're a business that's here to stay, do you think it's going to come across as more professional and trustworthy if you have your domain name, you know, my name at domain name.com or my name at Gmail? Exactly. It's inexpensive to do, guys. So if you're using a free email address right now and you have a domain name, which I hope you all do, get somebody to help you if you don't know how to do it and get yourself a professional address. Okay? Consistency here is going to be key. You want to make sure your branding is consistent everywhere. That's the other issue I see. With the proliferation of everything online, people will go on, oh, I heard about this site, put themselves on there, either incompletely or with whatever they had at the time, and then they forget to go back and update it. Uh, for many of us, we're the face of our business, so beyond your logo, you might also have a headshot. Make sure it's professional. Make sure that you don't have a 10 year old picture out there that no longer even looks like you. And make sure they're the same, if possible, across most of the channels. Or they, they can tell it's you, right? I worked with somebody one time, she had a 20 year old picture out on a bunch of sites. You couldn't tell it was the same person that was we were seeing that day. Okay? Got a lot of great photographers in here too. Take advantage and get a professional headshot. If your picture's going to be anywhere, make sure it's professional. All right, so recapping, we've had, we defined branding. We talked about the four steps to branding. So do you guys have any questions? I don't want to go all the way to the end and then make you feel like you can ask any questions. Anything? You did such a good job. <laughs> you guys are either already overwhelmed, which is scary, or, <laughs> or it's clear as fine. I hope it's a second. Okay. All right, we're going to do another quick activity. And this one is called Your Brand Survivor Style. And this is to help you start to get down there and figure out that it factor. So you're going to take what you did last time with getting part, at least part way through figuring out your ideal customer. And now you're going to figure out how, to, how you can most easily boil down that brand experience into just a couple of factors. So what we're going to do here is you're going to say what three objects would you need with you? Like if you were stranded on a desert island, it's kind of a little bit different, but what would you need to recreate your brand experience? We could only have three things. And then one special ingredient. That might be a song or a special, um, some, some little special thing. But it's not, not just an object, something extra. And then a skill. So I guess it's either a music, a smell, a mood. What skill would be most important? I do have an example, because I know many of you are probably going, what? So this was done for Disney by one of their employees. And in their example, and these may not be what you would think, but of course the mouse ears. You can't recreate Disney's experience without mouse ears. And then she thought you needed the popcorn with the, the bucket that goes along with it and the fireworks. So pretty good. You know, most people think of all those things. I would have wanted to take the Cinderella castle over the popcorn, personally. But, uh, and then the music, when you wish upon a star. That was her, that's what she related emotionally to. Her most important skill, pantomiming, the signal distress. <laughs> So take this, I'm going to keep this really brief for you guys again. It's just kind of for fun. It's on the next page, page three. I have that border here. And fill that out. And it's, again, what you're trying to identify here a little bit is what your unique value is, what your it factor is.
is a fair enough. Always remember that the way you're perceived is not necessarily the way you perceive yourself. Positive and negative. A lot of us are pretty tough on ourselves, so you might not recognize a value that you have. Okay? I know for myself, when they asked me to present, I said, gosh, you're making me follow Paul? Are you kidding me? And they're going, you're fine. People relate to different styles of training. And I said, yes, you're right. You're right. I'm probably more what people expect. But, <laughs> but um, you know, at first it was intimidating. No, I know it's going to follow Paul. Because Paul can get up there and just make you laugh and talk about everything. And, uh, you know, but they're, that's again where I say, talk to them and ask for the good and the bad. And really get to know it and be comfortable taking that praise and that criticism. Because you want to, ultimately, you want to elevate that praise in your marketing and really make that shine. But you want to address the criticisms. If you can address, it's like a Dan Kennedy principle. Any of you have heard of him? He's a great sales trainer. He will talk about every potential negative that your clients can identify should be addressed in your marketing. Don't leave them wondering. Make sure you address it. Okay. Now, brand marketing strategy, there are, this is kind of marketing strategy. Branding and marketing are so intertwined. And there are hundreds of ways that you can market your business and thus brand it. Okay? I can only go over so many today. So as I mentioned before, I'm going to focus on online and offline. But before we get there, I want to talk about a couple of principles you really need to think about in this day and age. Um, first is you need to integrate your branding and your marketing. You need to integrate into your vision, your values, and your story. So your vision is not where you are now. It's where you want to be. Three to five years, you have to reach for it a little bit. right? If, if you're already there comfortable, then you really don't have a vision. You, you just are. <laughs> okay. Your values are going to be those things that are so integrated into you, they will not change. You're not going to um, sway how you do business in a certain way because that is just integral to who you are, okay? Um, I mean, I could go down, we, we have a whole thing right now, right, where you've got the medical care and you've got a lot of um, people who are Christians, for example, who go, I don't want to fund abortion, right? Now that's a little bit out there, but it shows you just how stark, I mean, those are core deep values. So some people are like, no, I'll step away before I go there. So make sure you understand those things that you are, you hold fast to. Um, your story, again, this is that it factor. How are you going to integrate that in? Make sure it's consistent with your vision and your values. Because sometimes it can be easy to get caught up in a trend. And that might not really convey who you are. But for longevity, it's got to fit. This is an example I asked for some people. Not too many people apparently are really proud of their brands. Because I said, hey, anyone who is, let me know. And I'll highlight you. So this was from Stephen Mathis. He's a chamber member with Brown and Brown. And it's a, it's a sample of branding alignment. Now, I haven't done a big research on them. I'm not sure how overall their brand strategy is. But what he said is he felt that their logo really was in alignment with their brand because their corporate culture is built on vision, speed, agility, and strength that allows them to be very competitive in the insurance environment. And on both their local and their national website, they feature this cheetah. Mm -hmm. Now, other insurance agents, as I mentioned, again, this is kind of that animal thing. Other ones might have an elephant. You know, strength or pendulated. different types of animals are going to convey different things, right? But they're they're trying to say, hey, we are flexible. We can make, we can adapt. We've got speed, agility. We can adapt to change. That's what they're trying to convey. All right, and then how? And then again, beyond your vision, values, and story, you have to also make sure your brand marketing strategy aligns with these four P's. What is your price? Are you? Um, kind of trying to go after people who don't have a big budget or are you screaming? Uh, what is your product? And again, how it, it goes into everything. How is it packaged? How are you placing the positioning in? And that's where a lot of people get most from. What is placing positioning? Think of the difference, for example, between Hershey's Kisses and Godiva chocolates. That's positioning. One comes in a big old bag. People give it away at trade shows. They have it sitting out at their desk for their, their co-workers to come taste them. People buy it in bulk at Halloween. Godiva is special. Godiva is like for those people who want to savor every bite. You give it as a gift. It's seen as a leap. So there's a huge range you can be. And those are kind of like opposite extremes in positioning. And then your promotion. Based on your product, your pricing, and your placement or positioning is going to have a lot to do with how you promote it. 
you're not going to have Godiva chocolates more than likely you have a coupon in the Sunday B. You're not going to have Hershey spend the money on their own store in the mall. Right? It really, it, it's all part of that whole packet, that whole idea, right? You also need to make sure in this day and age, your branding is not static. It has to be interactive. People want to be able to reach out and get in touch with you in more ways than just the telephone or walking in your store. People are going to be talking about you on social media. They want to see what's going on in your lives. I think Pairings is doing a very good job. I know Titanium helps them with that of going out and staying in front of their customers. One of the things you've got to make sure when you're doing this interactive brand strategy is creating a relationship. You are not advertising your business all the time. You are becoming that trusted, loyal friend to people. So try to keep kind of an 80-20 rule in terms of any type of promotion that you're doing, um, especially on social media. Now that's not so much for paid, but when you're on social media, don't go overboard with promotions. And then provide information where your customers are and what they need. So that goes back to step one, knowing your market. Are they in a trade publication that they read loyally and maybe not even on social media? I worked uh, about six months ago with a cleaning company out of Canada. When we did their market research originally, they were going to do a content marketing strategy in social media. When we got done with the research, that all got scrapped. Their customers weren't looking there at all. 100% of their business came from one of two trade magazines and referrals. That was the only place that people looked for those types of businesses. If they didn't know that, they could have went down a rabbit hole spending thousands and thousands of dollars completely wasted. Okay? And then integrate all of your marketing channels. This goes again back to the consistency. If you are advertising um, on your website, make sure it lists all your social media channels. It clearly states your phone number. If you are on any type of a print advertising, again, cross market. But at the same time, don't confuse. Um, on print advertising, don't go out and list every social media channel and say, let me on Facebook, friend me, you know, let me on Twitter, just do all, you've got to say, what is my call to action for this particular marketing piece that I'm doing, and focus on that, okay? Another thing, um, just go a little bit more, your strategy needs to be backed up with SEO, which is search engine optimization, and this is going again, knowing what your customers are after, knowing the types of things they're searching on, you're here called keywords, and making sure those things are integrated in, especially to your online advertising, because when people search for you, they're going to be searching with keywords. How do I do this? Where, what's the best this? That type of thing. On social media, don't try to be everywhere. Pick your channels, and then make sure that you're active on those channels. If you're going to be on there, people may go on there and put comments about your business. If they're good or bad, you want to respond. And you want to make sure whoever's responding, I would call it that, that they're a brand ambassador. They know enough about your company and what they can and cannot say that they always come across with the right brand message. There are a lot of big companies who go online and you look at social media mess-ups <laughs> um, where big companies have had someone offshore handling their marketing or they had it all automated and they tweeted or posted things on Facebook that came across as very with very poor timing. Like there was an incident, I don't remember the details, but like when they had the bombings in Chicago and mm -hmm. something came out right around that time, it just was horrible PR for that company because they weren't really aware of what was being said. And then track. Um, you know, it used to be maybe you were only in a couple of channels advertising. When you get on social media or online, it's easy to be in multiple places. Google makes it very easy to have analytics and tracking to see where your traffic is coming from. So if you don't know how to set that up, work with somebody who can help you set that up. You need to know where your traffic's coming from and where it's worth spending your dollars. Because again, you might do that research, but you guys have limited budgets. If you go out and talk to 10 customers, and it just didn't happen to be the right sampling, you could be going out there spending money on a channel that's really not bringing you that much. Or you could also go out and find that, hey, when I advertise on social media, and I put this promotion out, 60 people saw it, and six people came to the store. I sent it out to my email list of 1,000 people, and I got 40 people that came in. Where should you be spending your money? Email. Right? You're only going to know that if you're tracking. The other thing to keep in mind is word of mouth is not dead. Word of mouth is just as important, if not more so today, than it ever, ever has been. And you have to realize that now it's actually more powerful than it's ever been. Because back in the day, we ask your friend or family member, hey, who do you recommend for a dentist? And they say, oh, I use so-and-so. And they would go there. No question.
questions asked. Maybe they'd ask another person or two, but they would pretty much just listen. Now, you ask a friend or family member, and seven or eight out of ten of them, so it's, it's right now the statistics says that about 70%, regardless of their age, are going to go online and look that person up first to make sure what you told them is credible. So you better make sure you have a website, not just a Facebook page. And you better make sure it looks professional. And then if there are if there are any reviews out there about you, they're good. And if there aren't, start getting them. <laughs> because your competition has them. This is some examples. I've got myself, an insurance company, a billionaire, and a dental. They all have reviews. You've got to be proactive no matter what business you're in and going out and getting some reviews and recommendations. I usually suggest you shoot for at least 10 on Google, 10 on Yelp, and then build from there. Um, those both are going to help you look more credible, but you've got to see what your competition has. Like in the, the plumbing industry, you may need 50. Same thing with dental. But insurance, the top, top um, most reviews for Roosevelt agent only had 11. So she doesn't have to get that many, right? So not like some of these other companies. Go out, do that. That's part of your competitive research. Make sure you know what you should go after. So on this grand marketing strategy, the biggest thing is make sure you're interactive. Make sure you're focusing on the word of mouth, the importance of getting reviews, the importance of getting reviews, and that you're guiding all of your decisions by your vision, your values, your story, and those four pieces. Okay? So again, do you have any questions? Something totally clear? Or are you all confused? Okay. I'm going to zip, zip through this. I'm trying to keep moving. I'm going to go through this other part pretty quick. We're going to do this activity real quick. This is, um, again, figuring out what does your company not stand for. This is going to help give you clarity on what you do stand for. I know a lot of you in the last exercise you'll see going, oh, this is harder than I thought. A lot of times you're going to feel much more emotionally connected to what you don't like than what you do. So I'm, I'm really going to keep this short so I get through the rest um, so on that next page. Go through on the right-hand side. Write down as you put these five things which you can't stand. These are things that make your stomach curl when you think about them. And it can be specifically in your industry or in business in general. Things you've seen people do that you would never tolerate. When you get home, I want you to take, to finish this exercise, spend a little more time, maybe five or ten minutes, and then go through and actually try to write out your story. Because this is the type of thing that you're going to use when you're creating your social media profiles or any directory citations or on your About Me section of your website, which is the second most visited page on any website, by the way, for those of you who didn't realize that. Go out and spend that time and write it out. What do you do? What do you sell? Why? What makes me different? What's the benefit to my customer? And why what you do matters. Okay? Take that time. It, it may take you 30 minutes. It may take you an hour. The great thing about it, if initially you start small and just change it on your website, maybe your Facebook profile, you can spend a couple weeks working on it and, and make it, you know, change it up until you're really happy with it. But definitely make that a priority. Okay? Is there anyone here who can share with me what their biggest dislike was and then the opposite of that, if they, if they really resonated with it? Go ahead. People who have selfies on there. Emotional advertising. I'm a photographer, specializing in business. <laughs> and I see these pictures, even on their cars, and they're horrible, like selfies. You can hardly tell who it is, and they're 10 years old. Yes. And so your opposite would be a well, right? beautiful lighting. Exactly. <laughs> nice, clear face. Wonderful expression. Looks like them. And I photo edit so it looks even better. <laughs> see, see, when you interact, you actually get a chance to also advertise your business. Nancy? <laughs> well, um, the don't I wouldn't stand for, and I'm thinking back when we did have a lot of employees, that we had uniforms for the guys, and Hans had a certain type, you know, he wanted the white shirts with the epaulets. Uh -huh. um, he always wanted the trucks to be marked with all the logos. We didn't want the guys having bad language, no swearing, everybody's professional, and of course we had to remind the guys, pop a mint. Good breath, no smokers breath, and um, please bring the deal right. Yes. <laughs> having the little things that mean a lot. You know, when you're in construction, I started out in college, I worked in a pool store, and I had to, I kind of do a little bit of everything, but one of the things I do is answer the phones. And so when I was going through this, I was thinking, gosh, how important is this? They were working with guys that these guys were rough. And I would get calls, I caught this guy peeing in my yard. Oh, yeah. this, these guys were, they jumped in the pool. 
and people were just furious. And you're talking to grown men, did you think I can teach them like their children? You, you can't do this. You can't do this. So it was really, it's really important to understand, especially when you have employees, they are the face of your business, and you better make sure that they're represented well. Okay. Now the branding strategies, I'm we've got about 15 minutes, but I'm going to go through these kind of quick. Okay. That you're going to have them on the slides that I'll send to you. This is just to kind of get you thinking of different things. We'll start with online. SEO, I touched on that. Search engine optimization, this is one of the best ways to get found in organic search, especially when someone is not searching specifically for your name, your business name. And really what's going to happen? What's an organic search? Organic is, let's say I'm typing up, um, where can I buy premium olive oil? And, and you guys show up on the first page. Okay. That's organic okay. so search. I didn't type parents, parents. right? Okay. So that's, that's the difference on organic search. Organic, showing up in organic search results for terms your customers are searching for is extremely valuable. I mean, the, the money you can save on advertising can be huge if you do this well. Typically, though, it's going to require a fair amount of very well-written content. And these days, content that's written for people to read, not gaming the system. There used to be people who create pages, hundreds of keywords stuffed in them. They read like crap. Google knows. And they'll just completely de-index that page, so don't do that. Just write well-written content, and I suggest, if possible, a steady stream. Realize a lot of you aren't writers, and you may feel that's just overwhelming. If you, if you don't feel you can do it, at least spend the time creating your website to work with somebody who will get some professional written content done for you and get, you know, eight or ten pages of decent content to start. So I see you on, I see you all the time, mm -hmm. throwing out information, but how often are you doing I basically, I, I don't spend that, that much time. You've got to realize it too. I, when I'm working for customers, I can see things that are good. I just, oh, I'm going to share that. Right? So as part of my work, that's a natural thing. But I only spend at max 20 minutes a day on social media. Social media, I talked to some of them. Social media is something that I, I do. I mean, for myself in this tournament. But it's not my favorite thing. I prefer content marketing. I like, but then I use social media to promote it. So if I'm going to write anything, you better believe it's going on every single social media channel that I have, right? And because I'm in marketing, I have more than I would recommend for any of you. Most of you here focus on two, maybe three at the most. If you're business to business, make sure you're on Facebook. I mean, business to consumer Facebook. If you're B2B, make sure you're on LinkedIn. And then maybe choose one other. Because most of you aren't going to have the time. And as your budget grows, then go ahead and add a channel. But if you can't be on it and do a good job and be active, don't bother. Okay. Um, what's, a, what's a good site to find like regional keyword searches? Is you know, there? I still, a lot of times I will use AdWords, but I will be honest with you. I still feel one of the best ways to do is go out and look at like, go on to Facebook, for example, mm -hmm. and see what people are asking in the area. Look at Twitter. What kind of things are people asking? There's different tools that you can use. The biggest thing though is talk to your customers. Find out what they're looking for. Right? Because on a local, local, hyper-local level, it's harder to identify these keywords that are really getting a high level of search um, if you're just doing it through a tool. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you, do you know of any gen where it's really, really helpful hyper-local? You know, we just do our own research and you know, we've got it, we've got it pretty locked down for local. Right. You know, always hashtagging the local um, business and putting in Rockland, Roseville, LinkedIn, mm -hmm. Sacramento, if you want to go that far, just in all of the Google searches. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what, when I'm doing it too, I do the same thing. If I'm working from a chiropractor, for example, I always put the city afterwards, and I see how many how many results came up for that. Now, um, again, make sure you're proactive, and that this is part of this. This is where your social profiles come in handy. Social profiles have high what they call authority and ranking. So when you do create your Facebook profile, you do create your Twitter profile, a Yelp profile, those things tend to show up in search. So it's helpful to have them and make sure that they're all consistent, again, and the brand with your keywords. Okay. Email, still a top strategy. And a lot of people are like, email's bad. I get so much email. But I, I will tell you the benefit of email. First off, it's cheap, right? You don't pay a lot. It's not that hard to ask your clients for their email address. If they're happy with you, they will give it to you. If they don't want to see your email, they'll unsubscribe. It's not that big of a deal. By the way, when I'm giving you my card, you will be on my email list. If you don't want what I'm sending you, unsubscribe. Right? It's very easy. Um, make sure that you realize you're enhancing your branding when you do your email. It's a great way to create that emotional connection. I, 
I recommend that a lot of my clients, especially those that subscribe to kind of an uh, industry thing and they just use that, add a paragraph at the top about you. Once your customers get to know you and your business, talk about your vacation, your kids, your grandkids, your new dog, whatever, because again, they want to know, like, and trust you. They're not just doing business with the business, okay? And the other thing with, um, with email, again, have that address, right? And make sure it looks good on a phone. Because over half your customers are going to read it from the phone if they read it. The other one thing with email, realize even if they don't read it, it's an impression. If they saw it come across, they had to hit delete, they still saw your name. Okay? So it's like a mini advertisement. Social media, find the right platform. I already mentioned that. Don't try to be everywhere. And look at where your audience is. So that's important. It may, it may not even be Facebook. Like I talked about that client, the, the commercial planning client. There wasn't regular social media channels for them. It was industry-specific sites that they needed to be on. Make sure you know where your clients are and be there and be active there. Be providing helpful tips and tidbits. A lot of what I provide is just like, I like that article. This could be helpful to people. I'm, I'm going to share it. Right? It's not stuff I always wrote. But it can be helpful to give your, if you have time, give your take on it. Okay? And then look at the number of users. There's always new sites coming out. People, oh, I'm going to get on there. Is it going to be beneficial? Or should you be where your users already are? If you, if you like to be that person who's always out the gate on the, first, on the new thing, then go ahead and try it. But realize that may not provide you as much value. Okay. Content marketing. This ties into your search engine optimization strategy and your social media strategy. If you're creating content, you have something to share. Content can be used over and over again in so many mediums. I can take what I did here today, get this video from Kyle, post the whole video, break it into segments, put it out as little training videos, um, take my slideshow, post it on SlideShare, put it on my website as a download. I mean, take what you're doing and use it as many ways as you can. Okay? And realize it also helps brand you as an expert. When you're putting out content and you're providing answers and value and benefit, let's say you have a do-it-yourselfer who likes to go out and usually they'll do their own catering. But then, oh my gosh, well it's my 50th birthday. And you just did a birthday party, right? I don't want to cook for my own birthday. And they might be a great cook. But Selena, man, she sent me all these great recipes. I'm calling her for this one, right? Online reputation management, this goes back to your word of mouth. Please be proactive. I've had a number of people call me and go, what do I do? I just had somebody slam me. And it's showing up on the first page of Google. Before my website. Okay? Now, had they gone out, and if you have, if you have 20, 30 good reviews and one person leaves you a bad review, do you really think that people are going to take that one as seriously? Most people will go, everybody has a bad day. Maybe their employee had a bad day, maybe that customer's a jerk. They're not necessarily going to believe it, but if that's your only review, or if you have three and one of them's really bad, they might go, oh, their parent, their brother, and their real customer, right? <laughs> so get out there and encourage good reviews. And when you do get a bad one, make sure your, your messaging is coming across as positive. Try to be that Nordstrom, offer that good customer service. So I, I would normally say questions, but since you guys have them, we're going to keep moving. <laughs> All right. Um, on this one, I think because we're running short on time, I'm going to have you do this at home. This is just a brainstorming activity where you're going to, I gave you a bunch of phrases, and they relate to those areas I told you about where you've kind of got your, your story and, and you know, your, how you say it, how you do it, that kind of stuff. Circle the words that apply to you, but then go through and try to figure out which one in each category best describes you. And again, that's trying to hone in on what your unique value is. Okay? And remember that when you're looking at the words, you might think, oh, I want to do this and this, but you're probably not. Right? Because there's times that words may seem similar, but you're going to do one more than the other. So pick the one that best describes you. And then take this information to go and, again, you've already started working on your profile. Now you know more words that you can put in it. Right? These are key words. So your offline brand management design, we've already talked a lot about that with your logo. Make sure it's consistent. Um, this goes all the way down to fonts and everything. You don't want to be an IBM style and have a script font, for example. It needs to be consistent. Uh, oh, I wanted to have this. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot I had that picture again. Manage your brand. This is what happens when you don't. Oh. Okay. I have seen other fails like that. You, you don't want to be the person.
first thing we're advertising um, the stork signs in the um, obituary section, right? So know where you're at to be placed. <laughs> and employees, we've already talked about this, um, thanks to Nancy. Employees are the face of your brand. Make sure they represent you well. Go out with them on appointments, follow up with people who they go see and ask, what did you think? Um, and then wow your customers. Under promise, over deliver every time. That's what's going to give you. People who love what you do will tell other people about you. And they will be willing to take that five minutes and leave you a review. Okay? But not if you just give them service they expected. It needs to be service that was like, wow, too loud. Also, offline brand ambassadors. This is for something like the chamber. I'm an ambassador myself, so I plug the chamber, right? You want other people, not just your clients, that are willing to talk about you. Because, like in the Thursday morning sessions, when other people give their testimony about your services, all of those other people go, I'm believing in that person. So even if I haven't used their services, I haven't used either of the catering services. But I can tell you if somebody asked me, I'll say, I have two great caterers. Because I've heard how wonderful they are and I believe it's true. Okay? So look for complimentary businesses. Even heck, your competition. You know, Jen referred over a client because they don't do reputation management. She referred someone over to me. Um, I do some video, but if I I know Kyle specializes in doing a lot of real estate videos. And if I had an agent that wanted a great video, I'd probably say, when well, you might want to Kyle do it. I don't have this good of good materials and stuff to do it all she worked with technology. So look for those opportunities. And then get out. Don't sit at home. Get out and know, get to know people. Because again, we're local. You're not Dell. You're not Apple. You're you and you're, you're your business. And so getting out and getting your name out there in the community, what that does is that tells people you're here and you're here to stay. You're not trying, you know, you're not going to be a fly-by-night business. You're somebody that they can trust. And they can be okay sending other people to you. So basically, we just talked about the brand strategies, and um, if there's any questions, I will be here afterwards, so I, you can talk to me. And then I'm, you know, I'm not going to go over all this, what you learn, but what I do want to say is, when you go home and you do all of this, I've got a funny little video here, and I want your clients to feel this way about you. Feel free to stand up and dance and just enjoy your brand. <laughs> <laughs> and then after you watch this, I'm going to ask you what your top idea is. Like a reputation video. So if you got some reviews, we'll go 
everyone the video that highlights that. Okay, and then, so basically, I hope, I'm gonna go back real quickly, I didn't touch on this, but, um, anybody want to just share, I know we're running out, any, what was the top idea you plan to take home and implement? I know I give you a lot. To uh, put things on my social media, uh, I don't really do that. Absolutely. Put something on there, right there. Every picture you take should go out there, as long as your client is okay with it. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Absolutely. And, and what concerns or challenges? Anybody looking at this from an off track? <laughs> Just overall? Our business has been up for 18 years. All of them were about. What, what's your business? Manufacturing and business. Okay. Electronic industry. Now you're in B2B, so you guys should definitely get active on LinkedIn. Start networking on there. You can identify your ideal customers on there. It's a great way for you guys to go about doing that. That would be the first thing I would suggest you focus on. Okay? So if you guys have concerns or challenges, there are a bunch of us in the chamber that do marketing. One of the things that you really need to do is find who you fit with because we all have a brand personality and we all have things that we focus on and do better, you know, one of us might do better in one area than others. So interview, find out who you can work with. If you, a lot of us have services that are pretty affordable because we know our target market is small businesses here in the Rockland Chamber. So don't be afraid to at least take advantage of it, okay? And I'm going to pass out real quick. By the way, Marie Fortaway was just hilarious. So in the slides when I send it to you, have my contact information. If you want to book a, a free consult, I'm, I have 45 minute appointments available and I, I can normally do about two or three a week. That's about all I can handle with the load I have right now. Um, but you can always sign up online, it makes it easy so we don't have to play phone tag, okay? And of course, connect with me on whichever social media profiles you already have. Don't create them, just to start connecting. Great information, very valuable, and I just want to thank you so much, Rebecca. I thought that there was valuable information, and what I especially liked was how you were targeting to this audience of mm -hmm. us being small business owners and so on. It's such valuable mm -hmm. information. Please share what your thoughts are about today's event and let me know. We'll collect those at the end. If you don't have one of our surveys, I have a few extra here. But this is very valuable as we continue to build on the Business Excellence Series, just our second one in the series. Our plan is to have a theme for a three-month theme and then move on to another theme. As you can tell, this one is the marketing and branding. And next month, again, will be marketing and your brand with titanium. Uh, so we focus on personal branding for personal. those of you that have businesses especially where you are the face, whether it's a real estate agent, catering company, solopreneurs, or even, you know, like caring, because you guys are the face of your business. It's, you want to take it beyond just marketing always your business. There's an integration. So definitely come in here, Tyler. Yes. Good. Again, back here at this, and it's the last Wednesday of the month. I didn't grab that paper that has the date of that. Look at all the information.